Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jennifer Bernstein, and I'm the president and CEO here at the New York Botanical Garden. I'd like to open our symposium by acknowledging that the New York Botanical Garden is located on the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We honor them and acknowledge their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. Welcome to the second annual NYBG Climate Week Symposium, this year titled Cultivating Resilience. Everyone here is aware of the dramatic changes that are unfolding as a result of climate change. In this anthropogenic age, human influence is evident in every single corner of the earth. The UN has declared this the decade of ecosystem restoration, underscoring the urgent need to restore the natural world. And here at the New York Botanical Garden, we know that this work of restoration with and through nature starts with plants and fungi. And we are dedicated to advancing that knowledge globally and applying it locally. This philosophy is embodied in our long-standing plant research and conservation programs and in new initiatives like NYBG's Urban Conservation Program and the expansion of the Bronx Green Up Program that helps to beautify and green our home in the borough. The Bronx is the greenest borough in New York City, by the way. I'm deeply pleased that we are joined this morning by Dr. Laura J. Martin, an ecologist, historian, author, and professor of environmental studies at Williams College. Pulling from her recent fascinating book, Wild by Design, Caring for Biodiversity in a Changing World, Dr. Martin will open our symposium by providing important historical context for the environmental restoration movement, pointing out lessons of the past that can be helped to address our 21st century problems. Afterward, there will be a brief intermission before the symposium's next session at 1045. So before we begin, a friendly reminder to please silence your cell phones. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Laura J. Martin. Thank you, Jennifer. And welcome, everyone, to this Climate Week Symposium on Ecological Restoration. The question of how to restore biodiversity is one of the most pressing of our century. Species are struggling, confronted with climate change, persistent pollution, and habitat fragmentation. There's currently more than around uh, 42,000 species that are threatened with, ex plants and animal species that are threatened with extinction, according to the IUCN. And UNEP puts that number even higher, around 1 million species. And it's not only that species are going extinct. Within given species, the number of individuals is often decreasing dramatically. One recent paper estimates that humans, over the course of history, have decreased the mass of wild mammals on Earth by 85%. By all metrics, biodiversity is declining. At the same time, life on Earth is being redistributed by climate change. As you might imagine, different species respond differently to climate change, uh, moving at different rates and to different degrees, often to higher altitudes, toward the poles, or to greater depths as they seek out climate-suitable habitat. The result of this global movement is that new ecological communities are starting to emerge. Species that never before interacted are now intermingling, and species that previously depended upon one another for food or for shelter are being forced apart. This global reshuffling of species is leading to unexpected consequences for humans and for non-human species alike. These consequences involve uh, problems with disease and invasive species, as well as difficulty cultivating desired species. In these ways, climate change is tra challenging traditional place-based conservation. This is a map of the current extent of global terrestrial and marine protected area. 
Today, there's over 280,000 protected areas that cover 16% of land and 8% of marine area. That's the areas that we're seeing in green and in blue on this map. The number of protected areas has increased exponentially since the 1970s. Yet during this exact time, biodiversity has continued to decline precipitously. Today, I want to suggest that place-based preservation is not enough. It's time to improve conditions for biodiversity on the 84% of land and 92% of oceans that are not under formal protection and may never be. This is where ecological restoration comes in. In my book, Wild by Design, I argue that restoration offers a more hopeful path than preservation and a more effective one. The book explores the tensions between wildness and design, our respect for other species' autonomy on one hand, and our desire to control species and our environments on the other hand. In the book, I ask the, the fundamental question, what does it mean to care for a wild species? Many of us have cared for pets or for houseplants, species that we choose to live with, uh, that we might even consider family, species that we treat very differently from those that we eat or those that we conduct experiments on or those species we consider pests. We have some sense of what counts as caring for these companion species or these pets. We, shall, we shield them from harm. We provide them with food, with shelter, uh, sometimes with medical care, with entertainment, perhaps even a monogrammed sweater. But we imagine wild species to be something very different, to be self-reliant, to be living outside of the confines of human society. And in the eyes of many environmentalists, human presence, even acts of caring for another species, diminishes the wildness of that species. And wildness, I'd venture, is the thing that so many people care about in other species. That's why hands-off preservation and strict protected areas appeal to so many people. The idea of leaving nature apart from us, aside from us, and not interfering. But in an age of habitat destruction and climate change, many wild species will not be able to survive without ongoing acts of human care. Ecological restoration confounds the seeming contradiction between the wild and the designed. I define restoration a little bit differently than the Society for Ecological Restoration defines it. I define it as an attempt to collaborate with other species to co-design nature. Unlike other modes of environmental management, restoration seeks to respect the world-making and decision-making of other species. Restoration practitioners so strive to cede some control of the restoration process to other organisms, but not all of the control. We could say that they're collaborating, even. While preservationists exclude people from designated reserves and hope that nature might be able to heal itself, restorationists intentionally intervene in ecosystems in order to undo past harms. This is a photograph of summer campers here at the New York Botanical Garden this summer planting sweet gum seedlings in the forest. Clearly the scientists who grew with these seedlings and the campers who planted them are playing a role, but not the entire role, in what the forest will look like 100 years from now. I'd like us to consider that they're collaborating, that the campers and the sweet gum are designing the forest together. One thing that's so compelling about restoration is that it involves so many different techniques and activities. So along with planting native trees like sweet gum, Restoration can also involve things like moving dams to restore connectivity between bodies of water, uh, burning prairies to stimulate regrowth for fire-adapted species, and breeding endangered species. It involves nurturing species as well, desired species, as well as killing undesired ones. 
So in the upper left photo, here we see snipers shooting non-native goats on Isla Isabella in the Galapagos in order to try and protect native vegetation. In the bottom left photo, we see a volunteer from the Coral Restoration Foundation transplanting a staghorn coral into a new site where staghorn coral has not been found before. The damages that ecological restoration seeks to undo are just as diverse. They include deforestation, overhunting, non-native species invasions, wetland filling, and increasingly climate change. What unites these diverse projects is that they're motivated by a desire to undo human-caused ecological harm while striking a balance at the same time between human care and non-human autonomy. Restoration can work, and very dramatically. So for example, this is a photograph from a farm in Brazil taken in, on the coast of Brazil, taken in 1990. This farm was replanted with native vegetation, and just 20 years later, it looked like this. Restoration projects like these are increasingly at the center of international environmental negotiation, as Jennifer mentioned. This is the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. And last December, the UN Biodiversity Conference approved the Kunming Montreal Protocol uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, the mission of which is to take urgent action to halt and re reverse biodiversity loss, to put nature on a path to recovery for the benefit of people and planet. In response to this, this just this July, European lawmakers approved a bill that would require EU countries to restore 20% of nature areas within their borders. The time is therefore right to think about how restoration can help to address the climate crisis, to ask how we can go beyond simply using trees to sequester carbon, and how we can actually reverse species loss globally. Today, I want to highlight two lessons from my research on the history of ecological restoration that we can use to guide restoration's future. The first is that biodiversity restoration and social justice need to be pursued in tandem. The second is that restoration is simultaneously a science and an art. To the first point, Restoration goals can and should be in full alignment with social justice goals. Often in the history of restoration, they were not. For example, the first wildlife restoration projects in the United States were explicitly white supremacist projects. In the decade after the Civil American War, American settlers killed some five million bison. Some hunted for sport, others hunted for profit, and some hunted because they saw the extermination of the buffalo as a means to force Native Americans into a burgeoning reservation system. By the late 1880s, the number of bison in the United States had been reduced from tens of millions to fewer than 1,000. And in response to this decline in 1905, naturalists uh, formed the American Bison Society with the goal of restoring bison. Their work is often heralded as a restoration success. Today, there's more than 400,000 bison um, in North America, up from that historic low of less than 1,000, so an incredible recovery. But less often do we talk about the land on which such restoration occurred and how that land became available. In Wild by Design, I reveal that the first sites in what is now the US National Wildlife Refuge System, um, administered by the Fish and Wildlife Service, were Native American lands that the federal government was systematically dismantling in order to erode tribal sovereignty. Portions of Indian reservations became the nation's first wildlife reservations. And although bison restoration was intended by its advocates to benefit the nation, 
Those benefits would accrue specifically to Anglo-American citizens who would view the bison as railway tourists or purchase bison from federal reserves in order to start their own private hunting or ranching enterprises. Today, some carbon sequestration projects are similarly displacing people from their homes. One 2011 Oxfam study estimates that at least 22,000 people were evicted from their homes in Uganda when the UK registered new forest company set up one carbon sequestration project there. In order to not continue to repeat the injustices of the past, we need to craft restoration approaches at a local scale and to meaningfully involve impacted communities in every step of the restoration process from planning through implementation and monitoring. As governments and corporations begin to invest billions of dollars in restoration, we need to ensure that the costs, the risks, and the benefits of restoration are equitably distributed. I want to zoom in now on the second takeaway from the history of restoration, and that's that restoration is both a science and an art. Because I think it's the combination of these two insights that points us towards restoration's immense potential to repair broken relationships, whether those are broken ecological relationships or social ones. Restoration has the potential to ameliorate people's alienation from nature at a time when few people know where their food comes from um, or know more than a handful of species in their neighborhoods. Care and repair can counter the helplessness that so many people feel when confronted with another headline about climate change, marine plastics, or biodiversity loss, the sorts of statistics that I began this talk with. I'd venture that there's no better way to understand and to begin to address how our vast and distributed systems of extraction and consumption harm other species than by working with those species directly, by holding a sweet gum seedling in your hands. Often, restoration is framed as a purely scientific or technical activity but as we'll see, restoration bridges techniques from scientific ecology and techniques from landscape architecture and even painting. In fact, the New York Botanical Garden is one of the origin sites of this approach to restoration. Many histories, many environmental histories state that conservationist Aldo Leopold was the father of restoration. Leopold was the author of the very influential and famous book, A Sand County Almanac, and he helped design the prairie restoration plots at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the 1930s. But crediting Leopold as the only inventor of restoration obscures the contributions of dozens of scientists, including the co-founder of the New York Botanical Garden, Elizabeth Britton. Elizabeth Britton was an international expert in mosses. And in 1901, in response to a donation to the garden, she founded the Wildflower Preservation Society of America, whose members would go on to develop both the science of cultivating native species and the art of designing restoration landscapes. The early history of the Wildflower Preservation Society highlights the connections between science and art in restoration. And it shows the importance and tenacity of the creative side of restoration. Elizabeth Britton modeled the Wildflower Preservation Society on the newly established Audubon Society, which was proving to be wildly successful. The Audubon Society was founded in 1896 when a group of society ladies decided to boycott hats decorated with birds and bird feathers. Birds were all the rage in late Victorian fashion. Um, by the 1880s, approximately 5 million birds per year were killed in the United States alone for their plumes. Like birds, wildflowers were fashionable late Victorian accessories. 
1887 magazine article describes how to make a table centerpiece out of native plants. And I think this will horrify the restoration ecologists in the room. A jack in the pulpit for the center of a pyramid, then a circle of purple violets with two sprays of red maple and a sheathing border composed of skunk cabbage leaves. It also doesn't sound like it, depending on the time of year, like it would smell particularly good. But citing the success of the Audubon Society, Britain argued that if New York women refused to purchase wildflowers, which were being sold by um, vendors on the street, um, that it would put an end to native plant over harvesting. In the New York Times, Britain uh, warned in one article that weddings were a new menace to native species. <laughs> In addition to these appeals to consumer choice, the Wildflower Preservation Society relied on art to disseminate its message. Local chapters of the society developed and distributed educational pamphlets, children's books, and plays. Wildflower pageants were performed in schools nationwide, shaping an entire generation's relationship to nature and teaching them about native species. Britain's Wildflower Preservation Society expanded rapidly during World War, II, World War I, establishing chapters across the country. Women accounted for the vast majority of its membership, with a few men holding leadership roles by invitation. But in 1924, Percy Ricker, a USDA botanist, began conspiring to take over the society from Britain, claiming that under the leadership of women, native plant advocacy had become what he called a sentimental subject, and that professional botanists, by which he meant men, had become, quote, disgusted with the overzealous efforts of individuals and organizations wishing to forbid all flower picking. <laughs> this exchange sounds kind of comical to us today, but the political stakes of what Ricker were saying were quite serious. By deriding the work of the Wildflower Preservation Society as sentimental, Ricker was tapping into a broader, a broader kind of post-war campaign to characterize women's professional groups and suffrage groups as dangerous. To combat that supposed danger, he aimed to exclude much of what was artful in restoration. In 1924, Ricker led a vote to reorganize the Wildflower Preservation Society with himself as president and two male Ecological Society of America members as vice presidents. In a letter to Britain um, that's housed at the archives here, he described the need of, quote, ladies with radical ideas to listen to a proper presentation of the subject. So this history helps us to explain why the, why the vital contributions of women scientists and designers to early restoration have been previously overlooked. But while Ricker succeeded in his hostile takeover of the Wildflower Preservation Society, he ultimately failed in his efforts to convince others that ecology was strictly a man's profession. A number of women scientists who had their roots in the Wildflower Preservation Society went on to develop the techniques of ecological restoration. Indeed, the first native plant garden in the United States was established by member Eloise Butler. I love this photo of, of Eloise Butler. Um, in 1907, Butler petitioned the Minneapolis Park Board for space to establish a botanical garden. Like the first botanical gardens, uh, which arose in Italian universities in the 16th century, Butler's project had a pedagogical aim. It would serve as a living reference collection. But unlike other botanical gardens, Butler would organize her plants by their environmental requirements, by how much sun or shade they needed, by how much water they needed, not by taxonomy, by evolutionary relationship, um, by shape or by color, the kind of ways that many um, botanical gardens were organizing themselves at the time. This was a new type of garden, an ecological garden. Butler's Wild Botanic Garden opened in 1907 on three acres of tamarack, swamp, and hillside. From the beginning, Butler viewed the space as an experimental space 
for the science and the art of ecological restoration. She maintained meticulous records of specimen origins as well as annual survival rates and flowering dates. She developed methods for propagating hundreds of native plant species, many of which, as some of you in the audience know, are incredibly difficult to rear. She kept a special designed water tank. She, she built a, a water tank to keep Viola lanceolata seedlings moist. To grow saxifrage, she moved an entire limestone slab from, the, from a river in Wisconsin to the garden in Minneapolis. She often went to heroic efforts to acquire species. During one expedition for squirrel corn at Lake Minnetonka, she and her sister Cora Pease, was, who was another well-known naturalist with ties to this garden, dug a hole under a nine-foot high chicken wire fence. In her journal, Butler wrote, we kilted our skirts and waded with impediments, trudged through the wet grass some three miles across the country to emerge dusty and triumphant. And I always think about what it would be like to do field work um, dressed like this. <laughs> when Butler was in a train accident in Ontario in 1908, she disembarked and used a broken pen knife to collect epilobium ciliatum. <laughs> Through these efforts, her garden gradually became a seed source for ecologists across the country, and future restorationists would learn from her propagation techniques. By the end of her life, Butler had planted 710 species at the Wild Botanic Garden, joining the 400 or so species that were already on site. Wearing brown overalls and high-laced black leather boots, she would chase away spooners who might crush her plants with a broken-off machete. <laughs> you can still visit this garden today. So while Butler designed the Wild Botanic Garden primarily as a reference collection for scientists, Edith Roberts was the first ecologist to design a botanical garden with the express purpose of researching restoration. And this was 13 years before Aldo Leopold's Wisconsin Arboretum experiments. Roberts received a doctorate in botany from the New University of Chicago in 1915, um, well before it was um, accessible to women to receive doctorates. And after World War I, she was hired as a professor of botany at Vassar College. As soon as she arrived on campus, she began developing an ecological laboratory. She had two goals. The first was to establish a facility to train students in the new discipline of ecology. The Ecological Society of America had only been founded in 1915. And second, to test whether native plants could be reestablished on degraded soils. Beginning in 1921, Roberts and her students cleared over four acres of grasses and poison ivy on the Vassar campus. And on this cleared land, they planted around 600 species collected from across the Northeast, arranging them into 30 plant communities that Roberts and her students had identified in the region. Roberts saw the ecological laboratory as a place where ecologists would generate knowledge about the science and art of cultivating native species. One reason this site is so important is that a number of Robert's students went on to complete graduate research in restoration in universities around the country. Opal Davis, for example, discovered that the two-year period of dormancy that's required to germinate dogwood seeds could be simulated by a 90-day period in a refrigerator dramatically reducing the amount of time that it takes to cultivate dogwood. And this is a technique that's still used, vernalization is still used today in restoration. And work at the Ecological Laboratory also led Roberts to collaborate with Elsa Riemann, a landscape architect who had begun teaching part-time at Vassar in 1923. Roberts and Riemann co-authored a book in 1929, American Plants for American Gardens, that would deeply shape the aesthetics of both landscape architecture and restoration ecology. 
American plants for American gardens listed plants by their environmental requirements that uh, promoted their growth rather than by geography or taxonomy. And it encouraged the use of native species in home gardening. The job of the ecologist, they argued, was to establish the environmental conditions in which native plants could thrive. Ecologists could clear dried underbrush and diseased plants, and they could thin forest cover. They could then plant new trees and herbaceous plants. Robertson Riemann um, explained that some species like milkweed require sunny spots, whereas others like bellworts required shade. This was really kind of uh, early, one of the first handbooks to local restoration. They argued that a wild aesthetic was achievable through constrained and artful human intervention. In other words, Roberts and Riemann articulated a complementary relationship between science and design. They wrote in the book, it requires no little art to leave the woods absolutely natural and seemingly untouched, and yet nature can be aided. In their view, the ideal designer would make sure to plant species of different heights and to arrange them in a pleasing manner. They would consider the decorative quality of species. But they would also consider the climatic requirements of species and their interactions with other species they would be trained in scientific ecology. They spoke of landscapes in terms of compositions that changed over time, and the ability of a restorationist to either create a true reproduction of an ecological community or to create a sympathetic interpretation of an ecological community. And I think this is a precursor, a helpful precursor to today's debates over whether restoration projects should strive for historical fidelity, and what we may call a true reproduction, or whether they should attempt to anticipate which species might thrive in the present or the future, what we may call a sympathetic interpretation. Eloise Butler had also thought deeply about the relationship between wildness and design in her Minneapolis garden. The express goal of the Wild Botanic Garden was to avoid all appearance of artificial treatment. And the word appearance is key here. Once transplanted, plants would be allowed to grow, in Butler's words, according to their own sweet will and not as humans might wish them to grow. Elsewhere, she wrote, my garden is run on the political principle of laissez-faire. She wouldn't water seedlings once they were well-rooted and she wouldn't fertilize them, but the garden was not entirely unmanaged. Butler and her colleagues thinned specimens when they were too prolific, and they uprooted plants, non-native plants, like dandelion and Canadian thistle. A century after Eloise Butler, Edith Roberts, Elsa Riemann, and others developed ecological restoration in response to the environmental challenges of their time, habitat degradation and soil erosion, were faced with the prospect of between 3.8 and 5.2 degrees Fahrenheit uh, average temperature increase by 2100, along with dramatic changes in storm patterns. Already, these climatic changes are challenging species. This is a map uh, that compares the current climate suitable habitat for sugar maple uh, in orange on the top to a projection for 2070 in orange on the bottom map. So you can see that the, in the United States, the available habitat for sugar maple is going to be contracting dramatically. This is a both culturally and economically important species. And I think what's so kind of mind blowing and that I'm excited to hear the panel talk about is that this is just the projected changes for one of an estimated 8.7 million species on Earth. Clearly, we're going to need to help species respond to climate change. And to do that, we're going to need science. We're going to need to understand species habitats requirements and life histories. And we're going to need better climate projections. 
but we're also going to need to make tough political and design decisions. The history of ecological restoration reminds us that the lines between science and art used to be much blurrier and they could be blurred again. And to not lose sight of the fact that designing spaces for other species is a political project, just like designing spaces for people is a political project. Turning from history to the present, I want to offer a few examples of contemporary restoration projects that bring these two insights together. The first is a project that aims to create urban habitat for the threatened powerful owl, Nyox strenua, in southeastern Australia. These are birds that don't make nests. They uh, use large hollows in old trees. And um, in recent years, many large old trees in southwestern, southeastern Australia have been removed from cities and suburbs. So for restoration ecologists to plant habitat for powerful owls, we're looking at 150 to 500 years for trees to grow to the appropriate size to have the right size hollows for this species. Realizing this, recently a team of ecologists and architects at the University of Melbourne have teamed up to design and fabricate artificial owl nests in the interim. Using the tools of both ecology, animal behavior, and design, they're working to find a way for owls and people to coexist in the same habitat in the present. A second recent example uniting restoration, design, and justice is the work of the Intertribal Bice uh, Buffalo Council, which is an organization of 80 tribes in 20 different states that facilitates the management of over 20,000 buffalo. Their mission is to restore buffalo to tribal lands for cultural and spiritual enhancement and preservation. Um, and Troy Heinert, the executive director of the council, recently told a reporter, the significance of buffalo extends beyond their physical presence on the land. They represent a positive force towards spiritual and cultural revitalization, ecological restoration, food sovereignty, health, economic development, and much more as each buffalo is brought back home. So the Intertribal Buffalo Council is restoring a keystone species that plays a role in thousands of relationships. At the same time, they're taking a step to repair relationships that had been intentionally severed by the US government and ongoing violence against Native people. Their work aims to remediate both ecological injustice and social injustice. A third contemporary example for us to consider is the Portlands Flood Protection Project in Toronto. This is a project set to debut next year, and it's one of the city's largest ever infrastructure initiatives. Over the past century, vast areas of Toronto were paved over, impeding the Don River's natural delta formation and making the city incredibly vulnerable to stormwater flooding. At the same time, the mouth of the Don River became the site of coal gasification and other industrial processes. And in recent years, huge storage tanks of fuel have rotted out at the Portlands, contaminating the soil and creating an industrial desert. The Portlands Flood Protection Project aims to develop a river valley, an entire river valley, that will minimize flooding in the event of a major storm, and also to build affordable housing and restore habitats for plants and animals. The project bridges social justice, habitat creation, and climate adaptation. The project includes 75 acres of wildlife habitat and housing for 20,000 people. Project planners are designing the environment to benefit both human and non-human residents. Some of the target species are dragonflies, turtles, foxes, and gray blue herons. The riverbed will be lined with dead trees and rocks of variable sizes in order to create um, micro environments for diverse aquatic species. And designers are going to plant 2 million plants that are um, 
hoped to be uh, resilient to anticipated climate change. Thinking about restoration as a collaboration between humans and wild species also provides us with a new lens with which to view some of the more controversial recent proposals in ecological restoration. Proposals for designed corridors, assisted migration, and assisted evolution seek to respond to the challenges of climate change and not necessarily to restore habitats to ways that they looked in the past. In 2013, ecologist Richard Hobbs and colleagues defined a novel ecosystem as a system of abiotic and biotic components that differ from those that prevailed historically by virtue of human influence. Everywhere we look, we are surrounded by novel ecosystems. And I think I don't need to tell this audience that um, where I live in Southern Vermont, white ash makes up about 9% of tree volume but most of those ash trees are dying or dead because of emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer arrived accidentally in North America uh, via, via packing material from China in 2002. It was first detected in Detroit. Proponents of novel ecosystems might argue that we need to accept that the emerald ash borer is now a component of Vermont ecosystems. This is obviously bad news for ash trees. Um, but interestingly, recent work at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology suggests that ash tree death is leading to a population boom among bird species like red-bellied woodpeckers, uh, hairy woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers, and white-breasted nuthatches. These species forage on infested trees and there are also cavity nesters that might stand to benefit from an increase in nesting habitat. Some restorationists feel that it's defeatist to embrace novel ecosystems, that by accepting novel ecosystems, scientists are just issuing a license to do anything to nature, to trash nature. Um, but I think that the concept of design can help us out here. Design is intentional. Novel, eco novel ecosystems arise unintentionally. They're the result of climate change and of unintended, unanticipated species introductions like that of the emerald ash borer. But our responses to novel ecosystems can be intentional. Accepting that every ecosystem is a novel ecosystem does not necessarily mean that we need to accept that novel ecosystems are our ecological ideal or our aesthetic ideal. Design concepts are perhaps most obvious in restoration in uh, projects that aim to increase habitat connectivity, uh, both at a large scale or at a small scale like this wildlife uh, corridor in Washington state. Designed and planned corridors allow species to move to new habitats, um, sometimes to new climate suitable habitats in cases where they might not otherwise be able to move because of barriers like roads, um, pavement, or cities. Here, human designers are centering the needs of other species. Assisted migration goes a step further from this. Assisted migration is intentionally moving a species to a new habitat that's predicted to provide the environmental requirements to support that species in the future. And perhaps one reason that wildlife crossings and habitat corridors are less controversial than assisted migration is because they feel more like collaboration than control. They provide species with an opportunity to move to a new habitat rather than physically picking up plants or animals and transporting them to a new place. Assisted migration strikes people, some people as too much like gardening like it involves too much artifice and intervention. But I hope these examples today have provided an occasion to question any strict division between gardening and restoration and caring for wild species. With climate change and persistent pollutants, there's no such thing as an ecosystem unaltered by humans. But this doesn't have to be a tragedy. 
Responsibility is one way of taking responsibility for our actions. Respons restoration acknowledges damage, makes it visible, and it attempts repair. It's not like um, preservation. If, if preservation is about where people should and shouldn't be, restoration is about how people should act. Into the future, we'll have to decide as societies and communities whether human-assisted migration is an appropriate mode of collaboration with wild species. Indeed, some scientists are even uh, pursuing assisted evolution, using gene editing technologies like CRISPR to create genotypes, populations of species that might be able to survive warmer temperatures, increased drought, or more acidic waters. As climate change continues to challenge the human and non-human world, the question of how to collaborate with other species is only going to get trickier. Into the future, it's my hope that more restoration projects will embrace the relational and creative sides of restoration as equal to the scientific dimensions. This means that we need to invest in cross-disciplinary training at present, landscape designers and architects have formal training in design, while many ecological restoration practitioners are trained in biology or ecology. Restoration could draw upon participatory design methods and more recent movements in architecture like liberatory design, decolonizing design, and design justice. As I argue in Wild by Design, restoration provides an opportunity for deliberate ethical thinking across disciplinary boundaries. Because always restorationists are making choices about which species to put where, even in restoration projects that are attempting to recreate historical ecological communities. Instead of looking only to nature for answers and asking peat cores or herbaria or colonial tree surveys to make decisions for us about which species should be in the landscape, restoration can comprise an optimistic collaboration with non-human species, a practice of co-designing the wild with them. Perhaps restoration is even choreography. Perhaps it's art. Terms like novel ecosystems and rewilding, I, I, I'd say, don't fully capture the ethical and artistic dimensions of restoration work. The question of what we want for the future of ecological communities is a design challenge. Can we move from an exclusionary model to a collaborative model? Instead of setting aside more land from human use, asking who do we leave out, can we instead ask who do we bring in? Rather than seeding space, can we share space? Can we design the wild with an eye toward justice? Thank you, and I look forward to the next panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin. That was terrific. We're gonna take a very short break and then we'll come back for the panel. Thank you. <laughs>